When we look and we see that things are not what they should be, God's counting on you. God's counting on you. When we look and we see that things are not what they should be, God's counting on you.
because it sort of permeates everywhere a little bit. But I just wonder sometimes, and of course you always look to somebody else for your problems and blame it on them, but I just wonder if there isn't a bunch of old communist cells or something that, that have kind of per just got in, you know, and they're actually pushing that kind of thing. There's somebody pushing this division. And, and, and I know a lot of it's just all of us, but at the same time, I sense an underground kind of entity that's there urging people to be divisive. Yeah. And I, I hate to use the word politics in here because it's almost like a swear word when you're in a good congregation. But at the same time, uh, I know that some of it's political, but I think a lot of it, you know, if we would just realize that the one thing as an outside frame of reference that we could all follow, and that is to realize this planet needs help. Mm -hmm. and, and we all need to do something. And if we don't do it, it's, it's you know, we're practically past the tipping point now. So the thing is, if there's something we can all agree on, that outside frame of reference, maybe it will work. Otherwise, who knows what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, that's a good lead into my topic this morning, compromising. But uh, before we get there, does anybody else have anything that re they reacted to in that reading? I like that line that says, there's some things we ought to be maladjusted to. So my question to you, are you, where are you maladjusted to this society we're living in? Think of those places where you're not really adapted or adjusted to what's going on. You know? and, and I think sometimes when that happens, you feel alienated somewhat isolated that you're maladapted to, you know, well, everybody's doing this, well, I'm not doing it. You know, that, that can isolate you sometimes, that feeling of being maladapted or maladjusted. Uh, humans are very pliable people, and I think that's probably a, a plus and a minus that we're so pliable. We can be molded in any way, shape, or form. But I think that uh, that's a question that we need to ask ourselves constantly. Am I totally adapted to this society we're living in now? You know, and I'll stop after this, but it seems like to me um, there's, a, there's a, a restlessness in our culture today. And, uh, you know, Sunday morning, you just used to drive around on a Sunday morning, you just hardly see anybody out on a Sunday morning. Well, if you get on the interstate Sunday morning, it's like uh, any other day of the week. It's just a massive, massive traffic, and it's going fast. And I don't like getting on the interstate because it, it runs so fast. So I take I get off the interstate in Hendersonville, come down through Slough and Tryon because I can slow down. But I just get this feeling there's just this, you know, there's two kind of races. There's a human race and a rat race. And I think I feel a sense of a rat race in our culture for some reason. And it could go back to what you were saying, this, this sense of, of, the sense of what I would just say, fear. Uh, my, my grandson was, uh, came home yesterday from school and said we learned about 9-11. And we asked him what that was all about. He told us all the details of 9-11. And I told him, I said, you know, the terrorists, the terrorists who did that, their purpose was not simply to kill people. Their purpose is to strike terror in the American public, to terrorize us. Uh, and I see terror and fear as like you, you have a, a dish of clean water, clear water, and you drop one little teeny, teeny drop of red dye in it, how it spreads, and how this fear and this paranoia begins to spread through our culture, and we're living in fear. Uh, and we have to say to ourselves, are we going to adapt to living in that fear? It was like Martin Luther King said, you know, fear breeds hatred. We fear what we hate, and we hate what we fear. So this fear leads us straight down the path of hatred. We're going to hate these people. They're going to hate us. And that, again, divides and splits. Uh, there's a bird that has wings that can't fly. Does anybody know what the name of that bird is? Is it a turkey? <laughs> well, that's two turkeys. Turkeys can fly a little bit. I'm thinking of the dodo bird. You know, I think that, I think, I think that bird might be extinct. I'm not sure. The dodo bird has wings but it can't fly. Um, we have a political system that has wings, a right wing and a left wing, but it can't fly. We have a dodo 
you know, government uh, right now. And I'm not talking about Republicans or Democrats. I'm talking about the whole system is divided. And it has wings, but it's not able to lift off of the ground. Uh, and so we have a, a dodo system that has really divided our country. And I think a lot of that comes out mainly from the fact that our politicians no longer know the art of compromising, but they've gone a step beyond that to condemn any form of compromising. Uh, and that's spilled over into our public, into ourselves, uh, into our society, that we're polarized and we're unwilling to compromise in any way, shape, or form. And to me, compromising is at the heart of any civilization. And a civilization, a culture that no longer knows how to compromise, is going to fall apart. And it was, it was this, this, this uncompromising mentality that led to the Civil War. So it's fearful of what we, and you know, some fears are good and healthy. It's important to be afraid of certain things. And, but you have to decide what, you, what, are, what are reasonable fears and what are irrational fears. You have to make that decision yourself. Um, but I think our politicians not only uh, don't practice the art of compromise, but they belittle it and negate it as something evil and bad. Don't, don't compromise. And if you remember a uh, uh, leader of the, was it Boehner, was, was the House of Senator, one of them was, was told don't dare compromise with this other side. But he's not the only one practicing that. When I left this morning, my wife said to me, she said, you know, when people think of compromising, uh, they might think about it totally as something negative. Like she, she said, she saw where someone said, my, my computer been compromised. So compromising um, has taken on sort of this negative uh, uh, ideal in our society, I hear in our society that Compromising is something bad, something wrong. You shouldn't compromise. But like I say, I think our, our culture, any relationship, I think whether it's a relationship between the state and the people, a relationship between myself and my partner, my spouse, or even my relationship with myself involves some form of compromising. Uh, listen, would you put those, I'm going to give you some definitions. That these just, I mean, I got these down on the internet. Google. I thought they were interesting. Basic definitions of compromising. While she's doing that, I'll read them to you. Com compromise, this is from, um, I'm not sure what dictionary. Compromise is a way of reaching agreement in which both parties give up something that is wanted, that was wanted in order to end an argument or dispute. Now, I would add a whole lot more to that definition because I would say compromising just doesn't end an argument or dispute. That compromising uh, can be part of reconciliation. It can, be, it can be a part of healing. It can be a part of atonement. And if you're aware of the biblical religion, the Old and New Testament, there's a lot of compromising between Yahweh, God, and the people, and they create a covenant. So it's more than just settling an argument dispute. It's, it's, it's much broader than that. The other definition is that I found was a settlement of differences by arbitration or by consent reached by mutual uh, concessions. Now, let me just pause for a moment and ask you, what do you recognize about those definitions? Anything, anything that stands out to you in those definitions of compromise? Give up and concede. So there's there's sacrifice involved. There's a willingness to sacrifice, which is always pain. Sacrifice is never easy. To, to, to sacrifice something, particularly something you hold dear, you know, and I think that's where the the real hardness and rub comes from compromising. Is that willingness now, you talk about forced compromising, are you ever forced to sacrifice? Well, I'm not sure if sacrifice is anything forced. I think it's something you choose to give. If, you, if you're forced to sacrifice something, 
you're going to resent it. You're going to resent the person that you have to do that with. You haven't got anywhere really to compromise. But anything else about that that anybody stands out? I thought about the auto workers. Excuse me? The situation with the auto workers right now. Right. You know, that you know, they have to do that. They have to sit down and, and figure out who's going to give where and what. Right. And um, that, that takes a lot. But that's a lot different than, than our politics. Yeah. And there's, a, there's a book I read a long time ago. It's a little one. You can read it real fast. I think it's from Harvard. It's called Getting to Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's really what compromise is about. Getting to yes, where we all decide what that is. Right. Okay, the other thing is, is the, the both parties in that first definition, a uh, way of rich and great for both parties. You know the old saying, it takes two to tango. Mm -hmm. so, so you can't have a, a one sided compromise. I don't think that's, I think that's an oxymoron. You've got two people willing to come together to arbitrate and and be able to sacrifice, which, as I said, is always painful. Um, now, I found these quotes, hundreds of quotes about compromising, but I found these that I thought were interesting. Uh, this first one by Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> if, you, if you set out to be liked, you would be prepared to compromise on anything at all, any time, and you would achieve nothing. Now, I, I have to point the finger at myself on this because, um, you know, nobody, like, nobody wants to be unliked. Nobody wants to be hated. We all want to be liked. And so in that, in that endeavor to be liked, particularly by your peers, you'll tend to, uh, you'll tend to compromise maybe your principles or your values. And that's sort of the negative side of it. Being liked is more important to me than standing up to my principles. You know, being liked by my peers and my group is more important to me than uh, protesting a certain thing that I find that I need to protest. So I'm giving up what, uh, giving up some ideal value so I can be liked. But I think that's a human human thing. We all want to be like, nobody wants to be hated. I don't want anybody here to not like me. They might leave the church and never come back again. <laughs> anyway, I like that. Something to think about, though. Are you willing to compromise because you want to be liked? You want to be popular? You want status? You want privilege? Are you going to give up your ideals? Um, and this other one I like. Politics is compromise. That by, I don't know who these people, I don't know who Patty Ashdown is. Uh, politics is compromise. Well, my question about that, are you talking about all politics? Are you talking about a situation where the political uh, uh, atmosphere is dictatorship or a tyrant? You know, you want to compromise in North Korea? I don't think you could compromise in North Korea. So what kind of politics is compromise? I would say, well, democratic, the democratic, you know, and that's one of our principles. We're a democratic society. If you want a democratic culture to exist, you've got to be willing to compromise. If your politics, politicians don't compromise, you have the end of democracy, in my opinion. I'm not living in democracy. I think so, the compromise is tied somewhat to that saying of win-win, uh, uh, or even like in a negotiation. It's understood that in a negotiation, you don't get everything you want, yes. but it's something much like a compromise. You're giving up something to get something. Yes. And going to your point earlier and, and her point about um, you know, the political situation, when you get sides or leaders that aren't willing to give up anything, and it has to be all their way, then, you know, then it's just a stalemate that doesn't work. Yes. Which brings me to the subject too of, I mean, the question, do you, do you compromise with the other side when you think the other side is evil uh, or bad or corrupt? And, you know, that's, that's a difficult question because to me, evil itself is a difficult thing to decide. The people who disagree, disagree with me are evil. Well, now wait a minute, do we want to go there? 
the people who don't do the things the way I do them are the evil. Um, you know, the, 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 the creation of one of our presidents of the evil axis, the axis of the evil. Well, who, who decides who is evil? Who decides what is evil? Uh, that's a very difficult, thorny thing to me uh, to, to make that decision. You know, we, we say it's killing, it's murder if it's outside of the declaration of war. Mm -hmm. That's evil. Mm -hmm. But if war's been declared, killing yeah, okay. is, is okay and even you can be a, even a hero for killing. So, I mean, there's a lot of gray area, which brings me to the third quote, the color of compromise is gray. In my opinion, it's very gray. It's not black and white. We'd like it to be black and white. We'd like to be a rule book to say, okay, you always compromise at this time. So I would say compromising is situational, which means you have to weigh every single situation by its own merits. You know, it's, and, and I grew up, Christian and learn Jesus the ethics that Jesus taught was situational. He didn't go by a book that says, okay, every time this happens, you do this, black and white. He weighed every situation, it's this situational ethics, on its own merits, and determined every situation on its own merits. The book says, the law says. Stoned her to death. She was caught committing adultery. It's black and white. Do exactly what it said. Don't think about it. Mm -hmm. Don't think about it. Jesus says, no. This is a situation. If you caught the man and the woman committing adultery, why did you drag the woman out here and not the man? Mm -hmm. Why do you want to stone her and not the man? So, I mean, that, that's a situation. Compromising is not black and white, it's gray. And you yourself have to decide uh, when and, and when and how you will compromise. Um, someone shared with me this story the other day. I thought it was kind of humorous, but you might not think it is. And by the way, uh, we were told in seminary your sermon might uh, comfort the afflicted. Kind of what you were saying, Barbara, up there with your child. It might comfort the afflicted or afflict the comforted. <laughs> so, you might leave here comforted, you might leave here afflicted. I don't know. Anyway, uh, this person said, uh, My first wife had her own idea of compromise. She decided what she wanted and what she thought I should have and told me that was compromising. <laughs> I would say, but you never asked me what I wanted. It's not a compromise because there's been no negotiation. There's a key right there. Uh, for years she didn't understand this, finally telling me one day that she read where the happiest marriages are those where the husband simply does whatever he, uh, whatever he's told to do. Whatever the wife wants. Uh, that's when I suggested counseling, but when the counselor told us we were a rare couple that really shouldn't be married, she was stunned. Later, when we were dividing up the kitchenware, she laid out all. She laid it out on the floor and told me to choose what I wanted. What? Well, finally, she's compromising. I told her, "Well, you can choose first. And she said, "Oh, I've already got what I wanted." <laughs> <laughs> we both eventually remarried. But, well, I won't read that part. Um, and this person went on to say, "My mind, a true compromise is not what one side decides in advance, but rather." What both sides agree to be fair for what it's worth. I left home with a few items for the leftover pile, deciding this was not the mole hill to die on. Mm -hmm. Choose your battles, you know. Choose your battles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this sermon popped into my mind when I was thinking about doing a talk. Thinking about what could I talk about and suddenly art of compromise. Because that's, that's, you know, I'm going to be honest with you right now and tell you that's where my wife and I are now. We're back raising an eight-year-old grandson. And we're finding ourselves at odds with each, other, with each other. And we've had some pretty serious fights already over how we're going to raise this eight-year-old. Um, you know, that's normal. Mm -hmm. And when people 
people say, oh, you shouldn't, that shouldn't be happening. Well, they must be from some other planet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it's normal. Human relationships and tension within human relationships is normal. You know, my wife and I both were raised by angry fathers. She was more afraid of her father than I was mine. We were both fearful of our fathers because they had short tempers. Her father would lose his temper and cuss and swear in profanity that he could not believe would come out of the professor's mouth. Um, she was deadly afraid of her father. So both of us growing up did a lot of peacemaking to keep our fathers happy. Um, you know, Martin Luther King said, you want peace, but you don't want justice. The white Americans, they want peace. Just don't disturb the peace. Mm. Keep it the way it is. He said, you want that, but you don't want justice. So my question was, we, we would say we were compromising to keep our fathers happy. We were both decided, no, we weren't compromising. That's not compromising. That's not the sacrifice that goes with compromising. We were giving up just to keep this person peaceful. Um, Heraclitus, was a Greek philosopher, was tinkering with a, a lyre one time, tuning it, and he was pulling on this end of the lyre, pulling on this end. He was tightening up the string to bring the instrument into perfect harmony. And he asked himself how that works. He said, well, it works because you've got tension on either side pulling. So the tension on both sides creates harmony and peace. So there was tension. My wife and I as children were dealing with the tension, but our fathers weren't dealing with it. Uh, it was all, it's, it's my way or the highway with our fathers. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to say this about anger because uh, anger, again, if you're if you don't think human beings have anger, then you're from another planet. We have anger, and we get angry, and it's normal to get angry. It's normal. It's normal to get mad and angry. It's normal. It's in fact sometimes it's healthy. The question is what you do with it, you know, where you go with it. I had my heart broken the other day. I read on the internet, well where Mr. Rogers had temper problems. <laughs> His wife said he had temper problems. And my whole idea was blown away. You know, here's Mr. Rogers on TV. At home, he's got anger problems. Well, you know, it, to me, it's, I want, my first reaction is, oh my God, you know, my, my deity <laughs> has been destroyed. And I thought, well, no, that's normal. It's normal. It's normal. Any human relationship is normal. Um, so anyway, uh, we learned, we, we decided we weren't compromising as children to, to keep our dads happy. Now again, I'm going to open up and be honest because I've had anger issues myself. And I've had to deal with those uh, when my children were growing up. I had, I had temper problems. Uh, you know, I, don't, I don't want to... They make you think I'm some kind of perfect angelic person, you know. Uh, it's not that we have these issues and that we're human. It's what we do with them, you know. And so uh, we weren't compromising. Do you want peace or do you want, or do you want justice? You're going you're gonna to compromise for the sake of keeping the peace. Are you going to bring that tension? We don't like tension. In fact, I don't like compromising. I hate it. And when I sent that story to one of my daughters, she wrote back, she said, I hate this. This is, I hate this. And I thought, we must be honest. We do. We don't like to give something up that we cherish. We don't like to give something up that we, we really, really want. You know, that's hard to do. A compromising like aging is not for wimps. It's not. Compromising is not for us. It's hard, it's difficult, it's painful. And we want to 
avoid it. But the other thing about tension is that when you have tension, that's the only time you have growth. And growth is painful. And the older I get, the more painful it becomes to grow, to age. And to try my best to age with some sense of dignity about aging. So, so that tension, we don't like that tension. You know, we want things done our way. We want to, you know, uh, we want to be right all the time. You know, I was, I, I was, I've been right all my life except one time when I thought I was wrong, but I was really right. <laughs> Or we went to see our uh, daughter marching in the band, and uh, she was out of step. And I said to my wife, I said, look, all the rest of them are out of step, and she's in step. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'll go, I'll go to great extents to be right all the time. And when I taught religion in college, somebody said, uh, this person from another country said, a professor, a, a teacher should never get up in front of students and say, I don't know. If you don't know, make an answer up. Make something up. You, know? <laughs> you want to appear that you know it all. You appear that you're right. So I think it's normal to be that way. But, but it's normal not to like tension. But with that comes growth. Um, somebody used to say to me all the time, would you rather be right or be happy? Would you rather be right or be happy? Well, I thought, well, what if happiness, what if being right makes you happy, then you're, I guess you're in trouble. <laughs> so compromise demands that, you know, why do I call it an art? I don't call it a science. I call it an art, the art of compromise, because I believe it involves the emotions as much as it does logic and reason, that, that we get emotional, you know. Um, we get emotional. Emotions are really hard to deal with sometimes. As people say, we don't have them, they have us. And I think that's true to a point. Um, how are we doing on time? I need to... It's 11.20. All right, we've we got 10 minutes. All right. I'm thinking I'm going to just bring this to an end because I want to hear what you all are thinking. Let me tell you, let me tell you something right now. I have a lot of trouble with... The way churches are set up. I do. I don't care for monologue a whole lot. I love dialogue. I love hearing what other people have to say. And I don't like the fact that I'm up here behind this pulpit and you are out there sitting in rows and rows and rows listening to me pontificate. I don't like that. We don't think of you as that. Yeah, you're, you're, I like it. You're part of us. We're all together here. Thank you. That's the way I feel with you. All right. Thank you. I like that. Anyway, up at the Bavar Church, I, I would set the chairs up in a circle. A yes. horseshoe. In, in the, I don't even like calling them the pulpit. And I put this podium in the middle. And over a period of months, you know what would happen? Chair to slowly go lined up again. I go in, I try to turn them to a circle, line up again. You know. Anyway, I struggle with it. I'm glad you're okay with it. But anyway, Mama Law, where was I going with all this? I don't know. Uh, oh, I said I was going to try to bring things to an end here. Um, you know, it's as strange as it may sound, I think compromising really begins at home and it begins within us because we have to learn to compromise between what our hearts want and our heads want and sometimes our guts want, you know? Sometimes what our other instinctual appetites want. <laughs> we have to learn to compromise with living with our instinctual life. Uh, we have to learn to repress some of those desires and impulses. Now, when you suppress them, that means you know they're there and you acknowledge that they're there. That's suppression. And you know that you need to guard against them. That you don't walk out in public buck naked and shouting profanities. You have to suppress those desires to want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> 
You can't have uh, sexual relations with every man or woman you see. You have to suppress that. But you know the, the sexual instinct is there, and it's powerful and it's strong. If you're Sigmund Freud, you think it's the only thing that exists. But it's there, you realize it. But you suppress it for the sake of society. For the sake of getting along. When you repress it, it disappears down into your shadow and it comes out of your pore of your body. And you have what you call Jekyll Hyde. You've repressed these instincts, you deny you have them, and they get repressed. And that's when trouble starts. We're all aware that we have things that our guts want, our sexual organs want, all that, and we, we suppress it for the sake of culture and society and getting along. I'd like to kill this person. <laughs> I'd like to punch him in the face. You know what I'm talking about. But I have to say, I can't do that. I won't do that. I can't do that. Because if I did that, I'll go back to what Martin Luther King Jr. said. The violence perpetuates violence. I don't want to get into that. So I learned to suppress those feelings and keep them down. You know, the Apostle Paul said, you've got to bridle your passions. You know, think about that metaphor, bridle. What do you bridle? You bridle a horse. Mm -hmm. You bridle a wild horse. Mm -hmm. You bridle your passions. You put a bridle on them so you can you can guide them in ways that are helpful and kind. Um, anyway, I'm getting way off the subject talking about compromising, so I'm going to bring it to a close, or else we'll be here all day. Um, and I'm going to close back to the, go back to that story that this person shared with me. Um, He went on to say, these days my wife and I compromise on a few things because we usually agree on topics. But I have learned that unless it is a life-altering decision, it's something not worth arguing about. The compromise <coughs> may be as simple as, let's agree to disagree. Let's agree to disagree. So there's... I close with these words, these thoughts. There's no science, there's no black and white rule book to follow when we, we engage in compromising. We are each on our own. We each have to use our own heads, our own hearts, and trust our own deep self that we can, through our efforts to compromise, we can bring healing, uh, reconciliation, uh, and, and atonement.